Mr. President, members of the Security Council, before turning to the report, I wish to acknowledge the important message from this Council in yesterday's passage of Resolution 2728. We need a ceasefire now. We need the release of all hostages now. The suffering must end. Mr. President, this is the 29th quarterly report of the Secretary General on the implementation of Security Council Resolution 2334. It covers the period from 8 December to 18 March. The resolution calls on Israel to immediately and completely cease all settlement activity in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, and to fully respect all of its legal obligations in this regard. Nevertheless, Settlement activities have continued and intensified. In total, some 4,780 housing units were advanced or approved in settlements in Area C in the occupied West Bank and in East Jerusalem. Of these, the Higher Planning Committee advanced approximately 3,420 housing units in three settlements in the occupied West Bank, including 2,400 in Mala Adamim settlement on 6 March, Another 580 housing units were approved in two plans in Area C, in Revava and Meve Oot, in Jericho. In occupied East Jerusalem, 700 housing units were advanced and approved in Jivat Hashaket settlement. In addition to this, tenders for approximately 430 housing units were announced for settlements in Area C in the West Bank. Demolitions and seizures of Palestinian armed structures continued across the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Citing the lack of Israeli, uh, Israeli issued building permits, which are almost impossible for Palestinians to obtain, Israeli authorities demolished, seized, and forced people to demolish 300 structures, displacing 314 people, including 137 children. 16 structures were donor funded. In a continuing trend, 35 Palestinians, including 17 children, left their West Bank communities, citing violence and harassment by settlers and shrinking grassing land. Mr. President, Security Council Resolution 2334 calls on immediate steps to prevent all acts of violence against civilians, including acts of terror, as well as all acts of provocation and destruction. Unfortunately, the devastating conflict in Gaza has continued alongside daily violence in the occupied West Bank. Mr. President, in Gaza, according to Gaza Ministry of Health, from 8 December to 18 March, at least 14,550 Palestinians were killed, including approximately 4,200 women and 6,000 children, and at least 27,800 were injured. This brings the total reported uh, numbers by the MOH since 7 October to more than 31,790 Palestinians killed, a majority of whom are reportedly women and children. According to Israeli sources, 134 hostages are still being held uh, captive, of some 250 taken hostage on 7 October. Israeli sources also report on 1,461 Israelis and foreign nationals killed by Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups, including at least 338 women, 37 children, and 633 members of the security forces since 7 October inclusive. Hostilities remain intense across Gaza, with Israel conducting strikes from air, land, and sea resulting in tens of thousands of casualties, massive displacement of civilians and widespread destruction, including of civilian infrastructure. Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups continue to hold civilian hostages, launch attacks at the Israeli forces and fire indiscriminate rockets towards Israel. The Israeli operations in Khan Yunis continued driving tens of thousands more Palestinians to Rafah, including those already displaced multiple times. Where airstrikes have intensified amid concerns of a major Israeli military operation. The fighting has seriously impacted the remaining functioning hospitals in Gaza. 
The IDF stated that its operations are targeting Hamas fighters and equipment, as well as tunnel nest network and other facilities used by used for military purposes, including in or under civilian infrastructure. Law and order are rapidly breaking down in Gaza as desperation grows. On 29 February, more than 100 Palestinians were killed and several hundred more injured in an attack involving Israeli forces during an Israeli-coordinated aid delivery operation in northern Gaza. At least 26 attacks have occurred on people at aid distribution points since mid-January. Repeated attacks on health Care facilities have been reported in Gaza, resulting in death of healthcare workers, patients, and internally displaced people sheltering in those locations. On 15 March, the Prime Minister's office announced approval of plans for an Israeli military operations in Rafah, including steps to evacuate civilians from combat zones. In the reporting period, 39 UN personnel were killed in Gaza bringing the total number of UN staff killed since October 7 to 171. <clears throat> Meanwhile, violence in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, continued at alarming levels. 159 Palestinians, including two women and 43 children, were killed by Israeli security forces during search and arrest operations, armed exchanges, airstrikes, demonstrations, and other incidents. One Palestinian was killed by Israeli settlers, and another was killed either by Israeli forces or by settlers. A total of 1,150 Palestinians were injured, including 240 by tear gas in the and 394 by live ammunition. According to Israeli sources, 10 Israelis, including two women, one child, and three security forces personnel were killed and another 74 were injured by Palestinians in shooting, stabbing and ramming attacks, and rocket and Molotov cocktails throwing, and other incidents. Israeli security forces carried out 1,937 search and arrest operations in the occupied West Bank, resulting in 2,119 Palestinians detained, including at least 72 children. Israel currently holds at least 3,558 Palestinians in administrative detention. The high number of fatal incidents during the reporting period precludes me from detailing all, but allow me to highlight a few. Most Palestinians were killed by ISF in the context of Israeli operations in Area A, including during subsequent exchanges with armed Palestinians marked by the use of increasingly lethal weaponry. Incidents include six Palestinians, um, including a 14-year-old killed on 8 December in Al-Fara refugee camps in Tubas. Eleven more, including three children killed during a three-day Israeli operation and ensuing armed clashes from 12 to 14 December in Jenin. And four Palestinians, including two children, were killed in Tulkoran refugee camp with five other killed in Nablus Palata refugee camp on 17 January. On 30 January, inside a hospital in Jenin, ISF killed three Palestinians. One of them was a patient. The IDF said that the, the three were planning an attack against the Israelis. On 4 March, a 16-year-old was killed in the Al Amari refugee camp in the largest Israeli operations in and around Ramallah for years. Settler-related violence continued, including several attacks recorded in the Jordan Valley, where hurting communities are at risk of displacement. On 28 January, Israeli authorities extended the administrative detention of a prominent settler by three months. Violence against Israelis by Palestinians also continued in shooting attacks in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem and in Israel. Three Israelis were killed near Ashdod on 16 February. Another was killed on 22 February near Maladumim settlement in a shooting attacks on cars. And on 29 February, two others, including a 16-year-old, were killed near the Eli settlement. Despite some restrictions on 15 March, thousands of Muslim worshippers participated in Friday Ramadan prayer in Jerusalem's old city with minimal confrontations. 
Mr. President, Security Council Resolution 2334 calls for the parties to refrain from acts of provocation, incitements, and inflammatory rhetoric. Nevertheless, such acts continued. Marking 100 days since the 7 October attack, a senior Hamas official celebrated and vowed to repeat the event, calling it, quote, a scaled-down model of the final war of liberation, unquote. Ahead of the start of Ramadan, Hamas also called on the Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, to escalate confrontations with Israel. A number of Israeli officials called for the, quote, voluntary migration of Palestinians from Gaza and the re-establishment of settlements there, with a minister posting on social media that Israel, quote, should compel them until they say they want it, continue to pressure them using force, starvation, and difficult conditions, unquote. An Israeli member of Knesset called on Israel, quote, to occupy, to annex, to destroy all the houses in Gaza, to build large and spacious neighborhoods, large settlements, unquote. Mr. President, Resolution 2334 reiterate calls to, uh, by the Middle East Quartet for affirmative steps to be taken immediately to reverse negative trends on the ground that are imperiling the two-state solution negative trends continued. In Gaza, the humanitarian impact of the hostilities have been cataclysmic and is worsening daily. Nearly 1.7 million people have been displaced with almost 1 million sheltering in Rafah. More than 1 million Palestine people in Gaza are projected to face catastrophic level of food insecurity by the end of May and famine in the northern part of Gaza is imminent, according to the latest IPC analysis. Indeed, starvation-related fertilities have already been reported. Most people have no access to adequate food, clean drinking water, or effective sanitation services amid a disseminated health system. The levels of humanitarian access of, and safety of humanitarian workers remain alarming, negatively impacting the humanitarian response alongside operational constraints and pipeline limitations. Near daily Israeli denials of de and delays of coordination of movement, including detention of humanitarian workers and ineffective deconflicting mechanisms and the lack of approval of adequate communication equipment and armed vehicles, makes humanitarian work extremely dangerous. Eight convoys continue to face attacks, damaged roads, and unruly mobs amid a security vacuum. Some progress was made on the maritime corridor from Cyprus, with the first shipment arriving on 15 March, alongside opening of an access point in the north of Gaza. On 29 December 2023, the Republic of South Africa instituted proceedings against Israel before the International Court of Justice concerning alleged violation in the Gaza Strip of Israel's obligations under the Convention of Prevention of the Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. On 26 January, the ICJ indicated provisional measures in the case. On 29 January, Palestinian Prime Minister Steyer announced the government reform program centered on improving accountability, reducing deficit, enhancing revenue and upgrading services. Following Prime Minister Steyer's resignation, President Abbas announced Mohammed Mustafa Prime Minister designate on 14 March. On 29 February, per an arrangement agreed to between Norway, Israel and Palestinian Authority, the PA started to receive the clearance revenue that Israel collects on its behalf. The revenues exclude an, an amount Israel says the PA transferred to Gaza, which the parties agree would be held in trust fund in Norway. The fiscal situation of the PA nevertheless remains extremely precarious with soaring unemployment and poverty rates in the context of increased movement restrictions. 
intra-Palestinian discussions took place in Moscow on the 1st and the 2nd of March. During the reporting period, Israel provided information alleging 12 UNRWA staff were involved in the 7 October attacks. The employment contracts of the active staff members were terminated and the Secretary General immediately activated an internal investigation which has delivered an interim report. He also appointed an independent review group which visited Israel and Palestine in March to assess whether the agency is doing everything within its power to ensure neutrality and to respond to allegations of serious breaches. Mr. President, Resolution 2334, the Security Council called upon all states to distinguish in the relevant dealings between the territory of State of Israel and the territories occupied since 1967. On 7 March, the Norwegian government issued a statement outlining that, quote, Norwegian business should be aware that, through economic or financial activities in Israeli settlements, that violate international law, they risk contributing to violations of international humanitarian law or human rights, unquote. Resolution 2334 also open, uh, called upon all parties to continue inter alia to exert collective efforts to launch credible negotiations. In the context of the current hostilities in Gaza, intense negotiations between international mediators and the parties continued to formulate a deal for the release of the hostages and a ceasefire. On 1st of February, the US issued an executive order imposing sanctions on persons undermining peace, security, and stability at the West Bank. Additional sanctions on two outposts and settlers were announced on 14 March. In total, seven set Israeli settlers have been sanctioned under the order. The UK, France, and New Zealand also subsequently announced sanctions against settlers. On 23 February, reverting to US policies announced in December 2016, the US Secretary of State stated that the US views, views Israeli settlement as, quote, inconsistent with international law, unquote. On 4 March, the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict released findings that there are reasonably grounds to believe that conflict-related sexual violence occurred in multiple locations during the 7 October attacks in Israel, and that there was clear and convincing information that sexual violence has been committed against hostages and reasonably ground to believe that such violence may be ongoing against those still in captivity. While the scope of the visit in the occupied West Bank did not include verification, the special representative stated that she received information about various forms of sexual violence, as well as sexual harassment and threats of rape against Palestinian men and women in detention settings, during house raids, and at checkpoints in the West Bank. Mr. President, in closing, Allow me to share the Secretary General's observations on the implementation of Security Council Resolution 2334. One, I once again condemn the horrific armed attacks by Hamas and other groups on 7 October. Nothing can justify these acts of terror. The remaining hostages must be released immediately and unconditionally. While in captivity, hostages must be treated humanely and allowed to receive visits and assistance from the Red Cross. I'm horrified by the finding of SRST pattern regarding the use of sexual violence during the 7 October attacks and sexual violence committed against hostages, which may well be ongoing. All perpetrators of such acts must be fully prosecuted and held to account. <coughs> As hostilities continue, I reiterate, there is no justification for acts of terror that were committed and the deliberate killing, maiming, and abduction of civilians and other protected personnel and using sexual violence against them. 
the use of human skills and the firing of indiscriminate rockets towards the Israeli population centers are violations of international humanitarian law and must cease completely. Secondly, I am appalled by the immense scale of death, destruction and human suffering brought by Israeli military campaign in Gaza, with civilian killings at a rate that is unprecedented. I condemn the killing of the thousands of civilians in Gaza, a majority of whom are reportedly women, children, and protected personnel. Nothing can justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. I am concerned over the, what may be violation of international humanitarian law, including possible non-compliance with the requirements of distinction, proportionality, and precautions in attacks. I reiterate that ordering the massive displacement of the population in Gaza without ensuring the basic humanitarian needs can be met raises serious concerns about compliance with the applicable legal requirements. The entry of humanitarian supplies has been far below what is required. Hospitals must be respected and protected by all parties and should never become battleground. International humanitarian law cannot be applied selectively. It applies to all parties to a conflict at all times and uh, the obligations to comply with it does not depend on reciprocity. I mourn the UN staff killed in Gaza. The courage and dedications will not be forgotten. The inviolability of UN premises must be respected at all times. The life-threatening conditions facing the more than 1.7 million internally displaced persons within an ever-diminishing space in Gaza must be addressed immediately. I'm extremely concerned by the possible nightmare of more than 1 million people being displaced uh, again, if Israel proceeds with its planned ground operations in Rafah. The world's leading experts on food insecurity also clearly document that famine in the northern part of Gaza is imminent. Palestinians in Gaza are enduring horrif horrifying levels of hunger and suffering. I call on Israel to fulfill its obligation under international law, including allowing uh, and facilitating the rapid and unimpeded humanitarian access into and throughout Gaza. The UN and humanitarian partners must be able to deliver assistance safely. This means that humanitarian locations, movements and workers must be protected more effectively and that the UN be allowed the equipment it needs to increase staff safety. I welcome the opening of a maritime corridor to deliver much needed additional humanitarian assistance by sea, but reiterate that, for, that for, for aid delivery at scale, there is no meaningful substitute to delivery by land. I reiterate my call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire and urge all sides to redouble efforts to reach an agreement that will bring about needed humanitarian ceasefire and the release of all hostages. I'm engaged tireless uh, with all stakeholders towards these objectives and stand ready to support the impl implementation of an agreement. I welcome the efforts, including by Egypt, Qatar and the US to reach a deal. I am deeply concerned by continued high level of violence and casualties in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Israel. Intensive Israeli security operations and heavy exchanges with armed Palestinians are leading to rising levels of casualties and disseminating many West Bank refugee camps. Security forces must exercise maximum restraints and use lethal forces only when it's strictly unavoidable to protect life. I call on Israel to abide by its obligation under international law including with regard to proportionality use of force and, the, and ensure thorough, independent and prompt investigations into all instances 
of possible excessive use of force, holding those responsible to account. I'm alarmed by the attacks carried out by Israeli settlers against Palestinians, including the, in the proximity of Israeli security forces. I urge Israel as the occupying power to take immediate steps to abide by its obligations under international law to protect the Palestinian population against all acts or threats or violence. I note the measures announced by several council members and other states against extremist settlers. Attacks by Palestinians against the Israelis must also cease. All perpetrators must be held accountable. In the spirit of this holy month of Ramadan, I reiterate the utmost need to uphold the status quo at the holy sites in Jerusalem, taking into account the special role and historic role of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan as custodian of the holy sites in Jerusalem. I note that prayers at the holy sites have proceeded with some minimal confrontation thus far and welcome all efforts to preserve calm. All sides must refrain from unilateral steps that would escalate tensions during this sensitive time. I remain deeply troubled by the relentless expansion of Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. The ever-expanding settlement footprint, including outposts, further entrenches the occupation while severely impeding the exercise by Palestinian people of its rights to self-determination. I reiterate that all Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, have no legal validity and are in flagrant violation of international law. The demolition and seizure of Palestinian structures, including internationally funded humanitarian projects, entail numerous human rights violations and raise concerns about the risk of forcible transfer. I call upon the government of Israel to end this practice in line with the international obligations and to allow Palestinian communities to build and address the development needs. I am disturbed by the multiple instances in which officials have engaged in dangerous provocations, incitements and inflammatory language, which must be rejected by all. I am encouraged by steps taken by the Palestinian Authority demonstrating its readiness to reform and welcomes the implementation of the arrangement facilitate, facilitated by Norway and agreed by Israel and PA that enabled revenue transfers to the PA. However, the Palestinian economy and fiscal situation remains in crisis, putting PA at existential risk. I urge the international community to extend immediate fiscal relief to the PA and for the PA to continue carrying out crucial reforms. I was appalled by the allegation that 12 UNRWA staff were involved in the 7 October attacks. These are being thoroughly and independently investigated while a review on UNRWA's neutrality is also ongoing. I underscore that UNRWA remains the backbone of UN humanitarian response in Gaza. The agency remains indispensable and irreplaceable, a lifeline for millions of Palestinian refugees and critical for regional stability. I welcome the resumptions of funding by some donors and continue to call on donors to resume funding as the continuity of UNRWA operations must be guaranteed. The enormity of the humanitarian security and political challenges we are faced with requires a collective, creative and immediate response. We must urgently address the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza. I regret that despite intensive diplomatic efforts, we have not seen an agreement on a ceasefire and the release of hostages. It is also important to support efforts to strengthen the PA to enable it to effectively govern across the whole of the OPT. Ultimately, any substantial solution for Gaza and the broader Israeli-Palestinian conflict is political. It is imperative to set the condition for an agreed political framework that 
can outline tangible, irreversible steps towards ending the occupation and establishing a two-state solution, Israel and Palestine, of which Gaza is an integral part, living side by side in peace and security on the basis of UN resolutions, previous agreements and international law with Jerusalem as the capital of both states. Thank you. I thank Mr. Winnesland.